Greetings, Chapel friends, and happy Valentine's Day. I'm glad that you joined us today, and I hope that you are feeling loved, because you are loved. Valentine's Day is a special day for celebrating love, but in the spiritual realm, within God's kingdom, every day, is a day of love because God is love. This is our theme today and in my opinion this is the foundation of all good Christian theology. We'll be looking today at two scripture texts. The first comes from the Apostle John's first letter and then later in the service from Paul's letter his first letter to the Corinthian church. But hear these words, words of love, from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. And anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have life. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son for us. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and His love is brought to full expression in us. This is the good news of love. Thanks be to God. is God? I bet you weren't expecting me to start with that question. I mean, is there a question more difficult to answer? Could anyone be more foolish than the one who thinks that she can give a full and accurate answer in 12 minutes or so? 
no less. I make no pretense at being a theologian. I still have to look up the big theology words. I have more questions than I have answers. But I can honestly say that one thing keeps me engaged with God and the Christian faith. It is my simple understanding that God is love. God is love is for me a concise description of God found in today's text. It's simple enough to be found on a bumper sticker and complex enough to be contained in volumes of theology through the ages. I cannot begin to offer a full and accurate description of God. But when I embrace the understanding that God is love, all of God's other attributes, they fall into a balance that my finite mind can begin to comprehend. We all come from different faith traditions. We come from different churches and different teachings on the nature of God. Some focus on God's power and God's sovereignty. Some focus on God's judgment. God's eternal nature, God's holiness, and the list can go on. Some tend to rank order these attributes in terms of importance for their particular perspective on the nature of God. If I were to draw an image for you of my understanding, it would certainly contain many attributes of God, but all of them would be understood within the framework that God is love. To illustrate, I might draw little circles to um, represent the attributes of God. God is eternal. God is holy. God is true. God is powerful, just, righteous. God is everywhere, present, relational, merciful, faithful. God is spirit, and on I could go. But then I would draw one big circle around all of these attributes, and that is love. Because I believe that we should think of all of God's other attributes in light of the love that God has, that God is love. Love is my framework for understanding God. As Thomas J. Ord, an open and relational theologian, has said, and I agree, he says, I believe that when our understanding of God's other attributes clash with love, we should reformulate the other attributes in ways that harmonize with love. I agree. And he calls to mind one of Charles Wesley's hymn where he's asking the question in this hymn basically what is the nature of God and the final chorus is thy nature and thy name is love I'll provide that to you in the email notes so that you can see it every other attribute of God is defined by God's love this is an important understanding for me because many theologians assume that power or sovereignty is the all-encompassing attribute of God. And consequently, that means that God has the power not to love. When we believe God's sovereign will comes first, we may begin to think that God can choose not to love, that God can defy his own nature. From an open and relational perspective, love comes before power in God's nature because love enfolds all of God's attributes. And this means that God cannot choose not to love. For love most fully defines God. God is free to choose how to love, but not free to choose whether to love. 
that will give you plenty to ponder through the week. But I must also add that God's love is uncontrolling love, simply because authentic love is uncontrolling. We are not fond of parents who, whose love is controlling. We're not crazy about spouses whose love tries to control us, or bosses who micromanage in a controlling way. God's love does not seek to control us or creation. God gives us freedom within the divine love and God invites us into relationship to work with God's love in reflecting love to the world. This means that we are co-creators with God in creating a loving world. It's not all up to God. It's up to us as we work with God. In all honesty, I don't think, actually I know, that I would not be a chaplain, could not continue to be a chaplain, if I did not believe in God's uncontrolling, unfailing love for all people, no exceptions. Can you imagine how different the world would be if we actually believed that God is love. And if we committed ourselves to work with God to love the world around us. Oh, what a world it would be. The Apostle Paul paints, I think, the clearest picture of this love in his letter to the church at Corinth. It's a text that you're familiar with, a text often used at weddings, and certainly it fits. But Paul did not write these words for a wedding. He wrote them to the church. He wrote them to you and me, to God's people, that we might have a clear understanding, a clear picture of what love looks like. Paul defines love not as warm feelings, doesn't really have anything to do with feelings, but as clear action to be lived out. Paul makes it clear that I can keep on preaching, but if I fail to love, and I often do, my words are empty, and I become a clanging gong. Paul makes it clear in this life of faith if we fail to love, we simply miss the point of the gospel. And then he paints a picture to define this love that he speaks of. God's kind of love. The love that I mentioned is not about feelings but about actions. And Paul describes what the world would look like if we work with God in loving as God loves. So consider these verses. They come from the message paraphrase taken from 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 13. No matter what I say, or what I believe, or what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut around with a swelled head. Love doesn't force itself on others. It isn't me first. Love doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Love does take pleasure in the truth. Puts up with things that are hard to put up with, Love trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, and keeps going to the end. Love never dies. We know only a portion of truth, and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompleteness will be canceled. We don't yet see things clearly, we're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before we'll see it all as clearly as God sees us 
knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until this completeness comes, we have three things to lead us on. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Perhaps good theology isn't as hard as we make it. So let's keep it simple today. God is love. This one truth is enough to sustain us all through all things. And I know that it's the desire of my heart, my ongoing purpose, to learn to love as God loves. And yes, I have a long way to go because let's be honest, sometimes it's hard to love. But I'm always glad when I'm able to move in that direction. We all wrestle with this. And God's love holds us even as we do. To live in the embrace of God's love entices me to work with God to reflect His light and love in the world. And so may the God who is uncontrolling, unfailing love. Woo you to live in love as well. Amen. In these moments, O oh Lord, we turn our grateful hearts to embrace your unfailing love for us. There is no way that we can measure the immensity of this great love. It's higher than the highest mountain, deeper than the deepest seas, as vast as the immeasurable heavens. Creation cannot contain the fullness of your love, a love that flows so freely, so faithfully to us day by day from your generous heart, O oh God. How precious is your love to us. Yet even in our gratitude, we must confess that we so often have doubts and even dismiss this incredible gift of love. We sometimes question, does God really love me? And then we tend to judge our enemies, and even our neighbors as unlovable. Oh, for the grace to end this destructive cycle. In these moments, we seek, O oh Lord, to embrace the incredible love that you have for us. And we seek to live in ways that reflect your love, O oh God, in our corner of the world. Through Christ who loves us with an uncontrolling unfailing love. Amen. So as you go, know this. God is love. And God loves you. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. So let's work together with God to love one another. To love our neighbors and even our enemies in our corner of the world. Go into your day in the love of God. Amen.